on the Jacob Beer Show, I am so happy to be joined by another face of the 419 area code. As most of you know, I am from Sylvania, Ohio originally. I then moved to Indianapolis, and I now am at Purdue University and a no AC studio in my dorm hall. So here we are. How are you doing, JR? I'm so happy to have you on another person from the 419 area code. I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm doing pretty good. It's a nice nice beautiful sunny day here in northwest ohio so i can't i can't complain same in west lafayette so take us through a little bit um you've worked in a nuclear sector you're an air force veteran Mm -hmm. the receipts came out you did not lie in the end um right so we can put that to rest um you also have done a musical song more power to you on that (laughs) uh you ran for office in a competitive race uh Mm -hmm. president trump endorsed you uh, if I recall, you are you dropped out due to some family things going on, but you're still involved yeah, like, relatively. Um, and I'm sorry to hear mm-hmm. about that. You're still involved um, in the political spectrum. So tell us a little bit about what you've been doing lately. Um, so lately, I've been doing a lot of work around the house, catching up on some things that were neglected while I was running for office. So refinishing my kitchen at the moment. Um, but uh, I've been, you know, um, had to drop out of the race because my mother had to have open heart surgery it was something that wasn't planned and um you know last cycle when um i was running for congress here my dad passed away unfortunately you know unexpectedly so um when the news of my mom's open heart surgery came um i I just wasn't willing to risk another parent out on the campaign trail so um fortunately my mom had surgery in cleveland with some of the best doctors in the country and she's recovering very, very well. So, um, it's allowed me to, you know, take, take some time to step back and and reflect and learn from, you know, the campaign last cycle. And I've been, you know, staying politically involved. I, uh, talk with Trump team, Trump's team quite often, you know, I'm helping local politicians here, um, on, on certain issues or, you know, campaigning, what have you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much my, uh, my most recent activity in a nutshell. And I've been, I have been doing some consulting um, in the nuclear power industry, but um, nothing major because I've, I just haven't had the time to, uh, to dedicate it. Awesome. And um, that's good to hear about your mom. So good to hear that she's doing well. So are you going to run for office again, maybe in a couple months? Um, We'll see. Uh, There's a lot of, now that my record has been cleared and it's been proven, you know, that um, the democratic party launched the smear campaign against me there's been a lot of activity a lot of people asking me to to get involved um you know marcy captor who i faced has been in office for 40 years and 41 now and um you know uh, cycle after cycle she hasn't really faced any credible opponents and with me um she actually had a challenge for once and um you know there 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 is the you know, the, the understanding that she's a, she is a tough uh, politician to beat, but mostly because she has a reputation here in the, in the district of this quaint little um, elderly lady who loves everybody. But, you know, I have, you know, irrefutable proof of how Marcy Captor truly runs her political operation, which is to lie and and smear. And, um, you know, there's some political operatives out there that, that um, believe that what she did to me is is something that that could definitely be used against her this cycle. And with, so, so what are the odds that you'd consider running? Would you say it's 40, 50, 60 percent? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm you know, I, I am considering it. I, I wouldn't put I wouldn't slap a percentage on it just because, um, yeah, I'm I'm having some meetings here in the next week and week or two with with some important people, and it's really going to be based on, on you know the conversations I have with them. Um, well, there is a chance that you might be on the political scene again in 2024. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, absolutely. great to hear. I think that's an important thing too, because especially from where I'm from, I got a big chunk of listeners in the Toledo area or Indianapolis area because that's where I'm from. I've lived in both mm-hmm. cities, so I just wanted to get that out there. And of course, you mentioned the record thing. I remember hearing about it. I remember my dad telling me, oh, what's going on? The guy's going to now lose to Marcy Captor home because of that. Um, but now the record has been clear. So mm-hmm. if the um, Republican Party would not pull money from you and they would 
put that out there, it could very well help and make it instead of 43%, it could get you over the finish line potentially with that new news. So it was good to hear you talk about that on the show. Um, take us through a little bit. So what was the biggest challenge of campaigning? You had been on stage with Trump a couple of times. You had been endorsed by quite a different um, group of people. Kevin McCarthy even came to mm-hmm. um, the area. Uh, then they later with that put ads and stuff. But take us through what was the process like running for office? So often nowadays in politics, you become a celebrity all of a sudden. Um, yeah. Just ask Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates, and you know both of them. Mm-hmm. So what was that process kind of like being this guy who, you know, you have tattoos, you put your lawn out there and, you know, you put a Trump flag kind of went viral off of that, had a career in the Air Force and nuclear sector. And now you're this celebrity, like you said, around where you can go to Kroger's and you're recognized. Was that tough for you being a newcomer? No, not necessarily. I mean, you know, I, I, I've had a career in, in, in the power sector where you know, I started out at the bottom. Um, I, I didn't walk into a, a position of power per se. So I started off in the nuclear security group. And then after um, doing doing work that that got me recognized by one of the vice presidents, they um, didn't under, did, they didn't know that, you know, I had a master's degree, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, one of the vice presidents asked me if, um, you know, I, I would be interested in taking a, a larger position. And, and so I, you know, I said, yeah. And, um, so I, I was promoted into management and then just rapidly promoted from there. And, um, you know, at the end of my career, before I started running for office, I was responsible for the spent nuclear fuel inventories for over 20 reactors in the country. So, you know, I went from, um, just the guy, you know, in the, in the union to, to, you know, being responsible for multi-billion dollars and worth of, worth of inventory of, of spent nuclear fuel, which is extremely, extremely dangerous. Right. So, um, you know, through that process, I, I learned to work with different people, work with different groups, my communication skills. I've never been shy to, to speak with people. So, you know, getting on the scene and, and going on and speaking at a Trump rally. I mean, I've spoken to, you know, large crowds professionally as well. So it wasn't, it, it was just a, um, you know, a, a factor of, of 10 basically. Right. So you go from speaking, speaking to 3000 people at a power plant to 30,000 people at a Trump rally. So it wasn't necessarily something that that bothered me. Um, what bothered me, I think, the most and, and the toughest part was um, fighting against an, a, a machine that didn't want you there. And I'll give you an example. When I ran in the primary election, I ran against a state representative and a state senator. Theresa Gavro and Craig Randall. Yeah. Yeah. Both of them were extremely arrogant, um, extremely... Um, they, they were not pleasant. They weren't, they weren't kind. Um, they, you know, tried to exclude me from certain things that, you know, in, in our, in our electoral process, you know, when you, when you go talk at a county, if a county, county GOP is having an event, every candidate should be able to speak. Right. And that wasn't always um, their mantra. So I had to fight that and I had to push my way through doors rather than, doors, you know, being not necessarily open for me because I wouldn't expect that. But at least when I got to the door, I'd be greeted with a smiling face because I'm a Republican, too. Um, so I, I fought really hard in the primary and, you know, I just outwitted these two. Um, they're, they're not and and I'm not no intentions of being condescending, but these are not the brightest people in the world. Um, and they took me for granted. And, and that have that's happened a lot to me, you know, like you said. I'm a guy with a beard and tattoos. People see me, they think, yeah, there's, you know, this, there, here's this guy that, you know, um, I, maybe I just give a, a brute look. I, I I don't know, but, you know, I've never, you know, um, walked into something and gotten it for free. It's always, there's, you know, I've, I've had to work and earn everything that I've ever gotten in life. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't something that I was, you know, shy, shy of, you know, or, or something that I, I backed away from. I, I fought tooth and nail and uh, won the primary. And when I won the primary, um, I found that the the elitists in D.C. didn't want me either. And so, you know, the the NRCC, they slow walked me into the Young Guns program, which significantly impacted my fundraising. Um, I, I had a multiple sit down sit downs with Kevin McCarthy. And uh, as you well know, I called Kevin McCarthy a traitor last year. 
um, when, you know, the leaked tapes of him and, and Liz Cheney came out about Trump being impeached, you know, he confronted me on that. And we had a man to man conversation and, uh, you know, we, we supposedly buried the hatchet, but, you know, after this, uh, these fake stories came out, you know, he, he, he was very quick to pull money for my campaign, but, you know, the, the, I think the worst part about running for office is that at least in the Republican party is that there's this, there's this, um, element of, of tribalism where these guys all and, and gals all band together and they trade things. Um, you know, it, maybe it's, you know, if you scratch my back here, I'll scratch your back there. If you help me on this issue, when you run for office here, I'll help you. And, you know, they, 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 they have little to no desire to let the constituents of the district decide. And I was a force multiplying factor in that because I was able to uh, work around um, their influence and convince the the people of this district that, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that could uh, represent them, couldn't be bought, couldn't be told what to do. And that was not scared of the outcome. Right. So, you know, I believe if you do the right thing and if, if you, if you do the right thing and you behave the same way consistently, you know, I don't care if, if I'm being watched by the police or my wife or whatever, I'm always going to act and behave, you know, with honor. And, um, I believe that, that, that will see you through. And, um, you know, I, I paid the price for that ultimately because the hit piece that was put out against me wasn't just something done by the democratic party that there, there was Republican party involvement in that. And so, you know, that's why I think running for office this cycle is going to be, uh, it's a big decision for me because they do not want me running again. And they've made that clear because me being vindicated on my military record, if the NRCC and Kevin McCarthy really cared about flipping seats, they would have been calling me the day that my records got lifted because they know what polling was like last cycle. And I was on path to beat Marcy Captor before that uh, military piece came out. Interesting. And um, would you say if you do run, you know, of course you'd have, I think, a good list of endorsements that would help you sure. possibly President Trump again. Um, like mm -hmm. you said, you're in different meetings. Do you think, I guess, would you say, what would you do differently this time around? Then would you just know who to trust or not? Would you not take a meeting yeah, with I've... Speaker McCarthy this time around? No, I, I, I wouldn't. Uh, so if you if, if you look at the um, if you look at the, the, the history of events or if you look the, at the timeline. They pulled the money, you know, right after the hit piece came out on me. And then, you know, when McCarthy was fighting for the speakership, when he was on, I think, round 11 or 12, um, one Democrat raised their hand and said, let's cross the aisle. Let's consider crossing the aisle and voting for Kevin McCarthy. That was Marcy Captor, okay? Um, and, and, and that's that's proven. One thing that I wouldn't do during the election campaign is I wouldn't commit my vote to anybody. And I take that very, very seriously. I know Kevin- Did he McCarthy, ask for look, your I, vote I, in I, private conversations? Absolutely, absolutely. I wasn't going to commit my vote to anybody. Was I convinced that Kevin McCarthy was going to be Speaker of the House? Absolutely. But would I convince him or would I would I commit to him to vote for him in a in a GMC Jimmy and, you know, in the Catawba Island Club parking lot getting ready to go into a funding event? No. And, you know, I explained to him that, um, you know, it, it 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 wasn't it wouldn't be right for me. Somebody that fought so hard for a district that has been led by this Democrat for 40 years to run into D.C. with my first vote being pre-calculated. And I said, what if Jim Jordan runs for Speaker of the House? And I don't vote for him. I might as well kiss my political career goodbye in, in Ohio. And, you know, his his comment was, well, Jim's not going to run for speaker. He's, he's going to be, um, you know, running the the one of the committees. And I said, well, you know, honestly, sir, I said, Jim could change his mind the day before, you know, the, the vote. And, you know, because I, I knew I knew um, what was going on behind the scenes. I knew what Matt Gates and. And Byron and all those guys were plotting because I was involved in, in communications with them because they thought I was going to win and I was going to be one of the people that were going to stand up and, 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 you know, vote against McCarthy and, and try to get some, some concessions out of him. So, but I couldn't say that in that, you know, in that time, 
because obviously we would spoil the soup. But, you know, I, I explained to him that if I commit to you that I'm going to vote for you, I'm going to vote for you. What I can't do is speak for somebody else. And Jim could change his mind at any moment. And then, then that would put me in a, in a bad position. And so he gave me the impression that he understood and um, everything was fine. And then two, you know, a day or two later, um, you know, after the hit piece came out, the, all that money was pulled. And, um, you know, I, I know why it was pulled. It was pulled because he didn't need me. Um, at the end of the day, Kevin McCarthy and leadership, they don't care who's the representative of Ohio's ninth district. What they care is that whoever that person is, is going to vote for them for whatever leadership position or whatever power aspirations that they have. And that that's all that matters. And so that's why you see them now meddling in primaries all over the country. Um, instead of getting things done in Congress, because they're worried about their personal power moving forward. For sure. And, and would you consider, um, one last thing about the public office, would you consider running for U.S. Senate? Or if you do run, is it going to be U.S. House again? Um, I wouldn't. I mean, I thought about running for Senate this cycle. There were, you know, a lot of people were, there, there were some groups get, trying to get me to, to run. But, you know, I think the, I think the Senate race is, is, um, that, that's a tough race, right? That's, that's a big, big $10 million dollars at least. Yeah. I don't, I don't have the, you know, I don't have the, the network to, you know, to raise that kind of money and, you know, but I run for Senate. Yeah. But I, I don't think I'll run this cycle. No, I, I, I don't. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a task that I'm more willing to take on, you know, when I know my limitations from a fundraising standpoint, right? If I would have gotten in months ago, then maybe, but you know, right now with Bernie Marino and Frank LaRose, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's many people that think they're going to beat Sherrod Brown. So, you know, there's, there's not a lot of money being thrown into that race at all. So, you know, I, I couldn't see how I could come in that race and, and be sure. financially effective. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, I think Republicans are going to, I think, DeSantis or Trump or God only knows who the nominee is will win Ohio by five to six points, but Sherrod, Sherrod's going to probably still keep on. It's going to be a close one, but there's a very good point that Sherrod's going to still hold on. So, yeah, it's going to, it's, it's really going to depend on how bad Bernie and, and Frank go at each other and you know what they're able to, you know, how, how bad, how bad are they going to damage damage each other both of them primary. don't appear to me as somebody who's from the state of ohio but neither does matt dolan quite frankly there's really nobody in the senate right now race that appears to me um yeah. so <laughs> now i just have to I, I have to i have to be mindful of what i say um of those two guys just because um, we still operate in you know in similar circles but you know at the end of the day um i'm not one to to hold my tongue and not say how i feel and, and that being said I feel like the candidates in the Republican Party this time around for the Senate would cause me to feel like I'm settling if I was to vote for any one of them. And I don't think voters should have to feel that way. And that in and itself is the problem with the Republican Party right now. We're looking for candidates outside of the spectrum of reality that that voters want to see. We don't want to see used car salesmen and you know we don't want to see guys that have been in government for 20 years we don't want to see um vanilla republicans that that aren't really republicans sure. you know that 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 fight against gun rights and all these other liberty minded uh, or you know liberty focused um issues and that's what we have and the reason we have that is because on the surface it feels like they're the only ones capable of running because the Senate race is such a financial monstrosity and the political machine doesn't care of the quality of the candidate. The political machine cares how much that candidate can spend. For it's, sure. Good it's point. all about money. Good point. And then one other thing I just want to touch on, you know, we've touched on if you might run or not, which I think was a big one, the military record there, which we had mentioned that. Um, as well as the race last time around and how you said you were winning with polling. I kind of, something I've learned from media is how Tucker kind of closes. And that is, do you think next time around you would be able to raise over a million dollars, get an endorsement from maybe the former president or people like Bayon 
um, people like that. And do you think you can get past the primary because they're going to go a lot harder for Craig next time? I've looked at the endorsements on there. Do you think you can get past there and feel 100% confident in beating Marcy? Um, Because some of these house races, with it being an odd year in 2022, they were more likely to flip, and then they're going to flip back in 2024. Do you feel 100% confident on all that stuff? And I ask that for any ninth District voters who might be listening. Well, here's the thing. I think for for this cycle, it's going to be different because President Trump's on the ticket. Um, You know, that Craig Riedel has become their stake horse, and, you know, if you were to if you were to kind of you know put the magnifying glass on that, you'll see that you know Craig wasn't their person at the beginning. Craig is somebody that they've picked because they're picking whoever's not Jr. Um, Craig wasn't endorsed until they saw me at Bedminster with President Trump, right? So you know they 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 assumed that I was you know meeting with the president to ask for his endorsement to run again, and, and I I wasn't doing that. I was there because he invited me and my mother. Uh, my mother couldn't travel, but you know he 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 invited me and my mother because of my mother's um, recovery from surgery. And you know when when he heard that she had the surgery, he wrote her a nice letter and and um, you know sent her a hat and, and a bunch of other things. So you know Craig is Craig is not again he he's you know I beat him in the primary last cycle. Um, he 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 does not resonate with the voters in Lucas County, and that's where he has to be. I mean the guy gets lost trying to find Tony Pacos. And um, that thing, I'm know, not Toledo, and I know where that's at. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he he he's a uh, he's a country club establishment conservative that you know is is in with the little clique that runs Northwest Ohio. Um, you know, there, you know, if you, if you look at what Craig's done, you know, in the state house, I mean, his last cycle in office, he raised I think a hundred thousand dollars, and he spent. 80,000, 80,000 of that at the Eagle Rock Golf Club and to a voluntary pension fund. So, you know, he's a retired CFO from a steel company and you know, the guy makes a good money. He's, he's, he's well, you know, invested. Um, he, he, but he's a, he's a, he's a fraud. And, um, you know, he attacked me when I first got into this race, he attacked Teresa Gavarone last cycle, very viciously called her, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that weren't true. And when he was confronted about that, he he was, you know, he said that, you know, it's okay to lie in politics. That's his, that's his perspective. He's one of five politicians in the, in the country that has ever gotten a cease and desist order from president Trump. And um, that was because he lied and he was trying to insinuate that he was endorsed by Trump last cycle. And then I received that mailer from a friend and I sent that mailer to team Trump and they issued him a cease and desist for it. Um, so, I mean, Craig's a fake it till you make it kind of guy. Um, there's been internal polling that shows if I was in the race right now, I would pretty much clean house, um, in the primary. Um, but the general obviously would be a little bit tougher, but, you know, I think, like I said, if you, if you look at polling last cycle, Marcy Captor ran ads starting i think four or five days after the primary against me and she never stopped running ads and she went as far as the photo manipulate pictures of me in front of the january 6 riot and insinuate that i was involved in that um i never as if really she wasn't up- as if she wasn't involved and in, yeah. you know going to blm rallies right right but despite all of that you know um She'd spent, I think it's like six million dollars by the end of September, um, lying about me and polling, you know, was was teetering my way. And um, you know, I I think that, you know, I was on path to win by one and a half, two points. Um, it may have been closer than that, but um, you know, if, if it wouldn't have been for the lie, I would have won. And I think Marcy knows that and, and Marcy's willing to risk that political capital because, you know, she, she's gotten away with it so far. Right. Um, nobody's she's holding been successful her. At it. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, sure. she lied against rich, rich. I years ago said he was a, a Nazi because he did some world war two reenactments. Right. Um, she's, she's lied about everybody. She hasn't debated in like 10 years. And she wouldn't debate me either. And her reason for not debating me was because she said I was a, 
you know, I, I was a insurrectionist and she knew that I'd been, you know, yeah, I was there on January 6th, but all you I've have to say was... is take your sleeves off because I'm from, Toledo, right. so unlike some people I actually know this area, good, take your sleeves off. We see your tattoos and we see her with a pen on from Nancy Pelosi. And you tell me what's Toledo, how values. And I'm not saying that as right. somebody who might lean right. I'm saying that as somebody who knows the area, I've seen the Greenville's I've seen the Chrysler plan in that town. And she's not somebody who's ever put her hands in there. You know, if she did, yeah. she'd have as many tattoos as you. So, yeah, I mean, Marcy's a Marcy has been successful preying on the, you know, the Eastern, the uh, East, Eastern European, you know, immigrant community over the years that grew up, you know, in the Polish village where I grew up, you know, over in the Lagrange Street, Woodward High School area, um, over on, you know, the Sylvania uh, Avenue area, right? All of those high dense um, Polish populations that were, you know, extremely Catholic, going to church every Sunday. You know, Marcy catered to those folks. We I went to St. Ursula Academy, same school as my yeah. mom. So, yeah. I remember my grandparents talking about her. I, I, I remember, you know, everybody wondering if she was a lesbian or if she was not. I, I, I've you know, heard they're, that they're, too over the years, funny enough. <laughs> lot of things about marcy and, it's funny because um, normally when i interview candidates i've interviewed them all over the country you know uh somebody like vice president dan quill doesn't quite know you know about tony packos but it's fun doing an interview with you because you know all these locations as i know as well so right. well true toledoans i true toledoans i think uh i did a survey on my facebook true toledoans prefer rudy's over packos anyway so I, I agree it's, with that. Even President Obama, the... even even President Obama agrees with that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jr., for coming on the Jacob Beer Show, explaining yourself a little bit more. Um, so it never has to be said over Twitter. So I really appreciate it, and I no problem, just want to say thank you, and and I wish you the best on whichever route you go. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, buddy.